Tom Rasulo, what's up, man? How hey, you doing? How's Appreciate it going? you being here, brother. Hey, thanks for having me. Cheers to you. You've worked with some other people that that people might know as well, haven't you? My Chemical Romance. Right, right. Um, and then Gerard, the singer of My Chem, I engineered his solo record. Gary Clark Jr., we did that uh, Black and Blue record. I got to work with Echo Smith um, on that Cool Kids song, which yeah. like just had a resurgence because of TikTok. And we flew up to Seattle for like a year and a half and worked on a Dave Matthews album. BB Rexa, who am I forgetting? Like Goo Goo Dolls, um, Andrew Lloyd Webber. Like it feels weird saying all this because I really, I kind of hate the name drop thing. But yeah, no, like, I'll tell you, but <laughs> yeah. this is kind of why we're here. A lot of us are introverts, so it's hard to go talk to people and make yourself available. Um, but it's it's so important to like get out there and go to open mics like yours and just like meet other people that have the same interest. Accept that you're doing okay. You know, you can get better and like use it as inspiration, but like you're not less than because they're doing something cool. What have you done for Dave Matthews, first of all? Uh, and then how did that come about? I got hired at Warner Brothers to uh, to engineer and assistant engineer. And I think this was the moment that I got the job. Uh, this is They're Good at That Shit, where I talk to musicians who are killing it in cer certain aspects of the game, talk to them about, you know, what it is they do, how they do what they do, uh, and hopefully we can all learn something. So my guest today, uh, he's worked with artists like Dave Matthews, other artists you would know. He also has a, a home studio, he's really good engineer, and a touring drummer as well. Tom Rasulo, what's up, man? Hey, how you doing? How's Appreciate it going? Appreciate you being here, brother. Hey, Cheers. thanks for having me. Cheers to you. Oh, yeah. Absolutely, man. All right. So uh, let, let's start with uh, Dave Matthews. Like, how did you, how did that come about? Or what did you, what have you done for Dave Matthews, first of all? Uh, and then how did that come about? Well, so I got hired at Warner Brothers to, uh, to engineer and assistant engineer and session drum and blah, 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 run around for this guy named Rob Cavallo. Um, he's like a world renowned producer. Um, and his engineer's name was Doug McKean. So it's actually a funny story how I got that job. I guess we can kind of go down yeah, that go path. Ahead. But sure. basically, I was in engineering school. Um, and at the time, one of my teachers, this guy named Chris Constable, was like, hey, there's there's a job opening at Warner Brothers. Uh, you should apply. So I was like, I guess I'll apply. I don't really know what the job is for. It's like, oh, you might get to engineer for this guy, Rob. And it was like a six-month-long process. Okay. And like the first interview, it was just like sending – you were like credits, which I had none. And it's like, we'll maybe call you back. They called me back. The second one was like, come on down to East West, uh, the studio down there in Hollywood mm -hmm. and sit in on a session. And like, basically it was just me sitting in the back of the room with a bunch of people I didn't know. And like, <laughs> I think they were just trying to see if you could sit in a, in a session and not be a clown. Okay. <laughs> so like, <laughs> so I sat there, I left, they were like, okay, we'll give you a call. They did. The third one was I had to go to Rob's studio in Calabasas and like sit down and engineer uh, like this random session. And like, I guess I didn't mess up because they called me back. And the last one was like, okay, this is the last interview. We're going to invite you down to Warner Brothers and uh, you're going to meet Rob finally because Rob hadn't been on any of them. So I walk into Warner Brothers. It's like Rob is behind this big desk and like this marble like warner brothers logo behind him and he's like hey how's it going and i'm like hey i'm tom he's like cool so do you have any questions for for us and like i think this was the moment that i got the job where apparently the other guy that had come down to was like yeah like what's the starting pay what are the hours like blah 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 and i was like do you have any cool albums to show me and he was i could just see his face light up and he was like yes and he like took me into this other room he's like i produce this one i produce that one blah 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 and i uh, i was like okay i guess that, that that went well and i walked out the door and i got a call like five minutes later and they're like you got the job like you can start in a couple of days so this is a long way to say that i met dave by working for rob okay because rob was producing his album and so my job there was to fly around with rob and doug and be their assistant engineer or their engineer when Doug got tired, basically. Okay. Um, and we flew up to Seattle for like a year and a half and worked on a Dave Matthews album. Uh, Dave put me up in like this really nice apartment the whole time. Like that whole crew is is rad, man. Like they're just so welcoming. Like everyone in the band wants you to feel like 
you're as famous as they are. You know, it's just it was like a great experience. Nice. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Um, and so you you worked on you know some of the the records, um, and like and you said so it was a really good like overall experience. Yeah, it was it was awesome. Like you're getting experience, which is awesome. Uh -huh. um, but at the same time, like you're kind of soaking in all the stuff you didn't learn in school. So when you're in school, they'll teach you like how far Mike's supposed to be away from a snare drum to make it sound a certain way. Right. But uh -huh. they're not going to be like, here's how to make a really good cup of coffee. And that's how <laughs> I get you in the room. Uh -huh. And so it's like those little things that like, I know Dave wants his coffee like this. So I go get his coffee like that. Dave's like, Oh, thank you, Tom. I didn't even ask for, ask you for this, you know? So it's those little things that you learn on top of all the other engineering stuff you learn, you know? What, what would you say you learned or what was your like biggest takeaway from that time working with him? Probably how to be a professional. Um, I feel like I was learning that the whole time I was with Robin Doug, but on that project specifically, I saw how Doug specifically, the engineer, like his relationship with Dave Mm -hmm. um, was unlike any relationship I've seen an engineer and an artist have before where it, like, it felt like they were really good friends and I could see Doug getting the best out of Dave because of it. Cause Dave was like comfortable. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I try to take nowadays and be like, when you're working with an artist, like it's supposed to be fun, right? You're supposed to laugh. Like it's a job, but music at the end of the day, we're all doing it because we want to have fun with it. Mm -hmm. And so that's the thing that I probably took the most from those sessions is like, it's going to be fun. Make it fun. You know? Absolutely. I mean, I've, you know, we've done some records together and uh, definitely it just feels like we're just in here, you know, chopping it up. We're just, you know, having, having a good time uh, making music. So that's, that's dope. Like, yeah. yeah. So that's definitely, I definitely feel that when I've worked with you personally. Cool. So yeah, yeah. That, that's awesome. Um, you've worked with some other people that, that people might know as well, haven't you? Pretty yeah. Nice. I worked with um, My Chemical Romance. Right, right. Um, and then Gerard, the singer of My Chem. I engineered his solo record, um, which was cool. That was like my first first engineer credit on a major label with, was with Gerard. Nice. So they took us out to like the middle of nowhere in like El Paso, Texas, oh, wow. and to this place called Sonic Ranch, I think. Yeah. Okay. Um, and that like we were out there for a month, like working with G. It was really cool. So I did that one. I worked with Gary Clark Jr. Mm. Um, that was the first album that I actually got to work on when I got hired at Warner. Um, we did that uh, Black and Blue record. Um, so that one was really cool. I got to work with Echo Smith um, on that Cool Kids song, which okay. like just had a resurgence because of TikTok. BB uh -huh. um, Rexa. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. Who am I forgetting? Like Goo Goo Dolls. Um, Wow. Andrew Lloyd Webber. Like, it feels weird saying all this because I really, I kind of hate the name drop thing. But yeah, it's no, like, I'll tell you, but yeah. this is kind of why we're here. Yeah, um, I mean, like, <laughs> I've known you for how long now? Like, yeah, well, seven years, and yeah. I've, I don't think we've ever talked about my credits or anything. Yeah, no, nah, we haven't. But, yeah. uh, okay, so how did some of those other, like, relationships come about? My Chemical Romance, Gary Clark Jr., how did those, like, kind of come about? So those were all, again, like, through Rob, because um, okay. he was producing all those records. Um so I met Gerard through working on the Mike Kim album. And then just like being in the studio that long with people, uh -huh. like you're going to develop a relationship, yeah. especially if like you're fun to be around. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, sure. so Gerard and Ray and the rest of the guys were cool with me, you know, coming on the solo record and stuff. They're like, oh yeah, Tom should come and engineer. And then Doug was like, this is my guy. Um, so they're like, yeah, bring him along. And then you're just around people enough. Like, it's late at night after you've like been recording all day. It's like the whole, like they're the successful musician and you're like an engineer, like that all kind of melts away and you guys just start like chopping it up about real life stuff, mm -hmm. you know? And then mm -hmm. that's how the relationships form. It's yeah. like put two people in a room together for long enough with common interests and like you're going to develop a relationship. You got to work with all these amazing people. Um, you're also... Like you're just a really good just musician. I feel like your like knowledge of like theory and just stuff is crazy. You play basically every instrument. Um, so like, how did how did that like happen? How did you get to like be able to just play everything and just kind of know? I feel like you just know something about everything. You know what I mean? Like, how did <laughs> yeah. that kind of um, happen? So when I was uh, seven years old, 
um, my stepmom and my dad got married. Mm -hmm. And my stepmom uh, had gone to Yale and got her master's degree in music performance. Mm. Uh, so she played violin. And when she married my dad, she was like, you are learning piano. <laughs> okay. And I like... Dude, I was so against it. Like, uh -huh. I hated it. I was like, I don't want to learn theory. This is dumb. Like, I was not a good student. Mm -hmm. um, and then over time, I started to kind of fall in love with it, of mm. course. Yeah, right. And then I think if you learn piano first, you can kind of learn anything else. Mm. Like, you've got a visual cue right in front of you where all the notes are. Mm -hmm. It teaches you taste where you're like, oh, I can use reverb with this pedal down here. Oh, I should know when to use it and when not to use it. it teaches you polyrhythms like right and left hand. Um, it teaches you your dynamics. It's like, it's everything. Uh -huh. So as far as like guitar and whatnot, I just spent a lot of time around people who are really good, <laughs> really good at guitar and like mm. kind of copied them. Right. And then just kind of fake my way through it. Like to be honest... If someone was like, hey, can you play these different chords on a guitar? We've got a show tonight. I probably I probably couldn't do it. Mm. But if someone's like, we got a show in a week, can you learn it? I could I could do that. Right. Um, and then drums, I've been playing since I was like eight. Because when you learn piano, at least for me, I was like, drums came easy. Because I'm like, oh, I already can do the rhythm. I don't have to worry about the notes. That's fine. So I started playing drums in church. Mm. And uh, I was like this young kid in church playing and then I joined Drumline when I was in high school, taught me all like polyrhythms and whatnot. And I mean, your uh, rudiments and everything. Um, and then I did DCI, which is Drum Corps International, mm -hmm. when I was like 17. So you're on the road, like going around all of America for the whole summer. And then, yeah, you just like kind of play kit as you're doing all that stuff. And then I just uh, was always in bands. So like, that's a long-winded answer to just say, like, I've just been playing. <laughs> like, you're, you're by yourself in your room enough, like, practicing. You'll learn how to play everything if you want to. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and I guess that's a good way to segue into, because you also tour as a drummer. and You play with a lot of different bands as a drummer. One thing I definitely wanted to ask you about is, like, how do you manage, like, doing all these things? Because you have, like your sessions so like i'll come here for sessions uh you know some days and then a lot of days you're off you know you're on the on tour mm -hmm. uh as a touring drummer so how do you like how do you manage all that stuff <laughs> that's a good question <laughs> it's like you kind of at least for me i like to be busy um but i really like being on the road i really like producing and engineering um and i also really like having off like time off <laughs> and so i kind of plan all of it right mm. Um, I guess the, it's a hard question to answer about like, how do you juggle all of it? Cause yeah. I just kind of take it like a month at a time. I'm like, okay, what do I got this month? And then like, you'll hit me up and you're like, Hey, do you have any time for a session? I'll just like open my calendar and be like, I got a Thursday in like two days. And you're like, cool, let me grab that. And then I put you down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, you're always just kind of looking a little far out in advance, but not like so far that you're going to drive yourself insane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it helps with tours too, because the band that I'm in right now, uh, Bo Grigri and the Apocalypse, like yeah. we're touring in the UK and Europe a lot. So they have to plan those like months in advance. Sure. Um, so I can tell artists like yourself, like, hey, I can't be here for from, you know, this date to this date because we're going to be in Europe, but that's in like six months. So if you want to start something now, you know, you know that there's a cutoff date where I might not be able to work on it. Sure. And another date where, you know, I'll be back. Yeah. yeah. Uh, talk about being on the road. How's that? How's that been? Like, it's cool, man. Yeah. Yeah. I I always thought that, like, I always liked the road. Uh -huh. um, but I thought as I got older, I would hate it more. Um, but it's good touring with other artists who are at their same, like, stage in life. Because we're not, like, sleeping on the floor. Mm -hmm. And we're not, like trying to sleep in the van and whatnot we're staying in hotels and like we're getting like big comfy like almost buses they're like yeah. a one step below a bus it's like a huge van that like has tables in it and whatnot um so being on the road is really cool it's tiring for sure though mm -hmm. um you definitely put your work in even when you have a drum tech like i'm not the type to just be like pack up my stuff yeah. you know like if i have somebody helping me i'm gonna help them help yeah. me yeah um so it's tiring like when you get home, you pass out for like four days. But yeah, the road is cool, man. Seeing different people every night and going to a different town, like it's pretty fulfilling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you have any like crazy stories from the road? Like, 
Let's see, crazy stories. <laughs> well, it's definitely not as much of a party as you would think mm, okay. because you kind of don't have time. Like, uh. you know, when like you're younger and you're like, I'm going to go on the road and there's going to be like chicks and there's going to be like, <laughs> I'm going to get drunk every night and like we're going to be rock stars. It's right, like right. now you show up, you unload, you sound check, you go get dinner, you come back, you play your show. <laughs> And we play for two hours each night. So, mm -hmm. like, you play your two-hour set, you do the autograph thing afterwards. Then, after everyone's out of there, you pack up all your stuff, you yeah. get in the van. And then, like, by that point, you're like, I'm worn, <laughs> I'm worn out. And so you go to your hotel, yeah. and you pass out. And then the next morning, you wake up, and you drive to the next place, and you do it all again. Yeah. So, as far as crazy stories, I, I'm like, I'm lame. I don't really, yeah. I don't really yeah. have a whole lot. Like, there's cool places I've been to, like... I did go out in Edinburgh, uh -huh. in Scotland. Um, after a show we played there, I had friends that flew in from Sweden, and they met us. They they saw the show, and afterwards, it's like we're going out in Edinburgh. And so the whole band went out with them. We found this club that was playing like '90s hip hop and stuff, and we like we just danced until like four in the morning, yeah. even though and we had an off day the next day. So we're like, we can do this. Yeah. So that was fun. Like that was as close as I've got to like let's party you know <laughs> awesome man yeah that's what's up um how how long have you been playing with uh bo gregory and apocalypse um since 2021 i think i could be wrong maybe 22 um they've been a band for a while um and they had projects together it's like the singer and guitarist that started mm -hmm. the band they mm -hmm. are married okay so they've been doing stuff together for a really long time got it um and they had an old drummer that um was in a former band called the hoax with the guitarist uh -huh. and then he had to go do his own thing so they found me just at a random show um and we had like mutual friends um but we had never met each other yet so they found me they're just like hey we need a drummer for this mammoth gig coming up do you want to fill in i was like sure so i like learned all the stuff and we all hit it off and they're like do you just want to be the guy so yeah it's been like two and a half years ish that could be wrong, but oh, okay. it's been like, it's, you know, within that range, two nice, to three yeah. years. And so I, obviously it seems to be going really well. Yeah. Yeah. It's going cool. We just um, released a new album this year, um, back in May, um, called Hot Nostalgia Radio. Uh -huh. um, I engineered that in their studio out in uh, Riverside. Okay. Um, and we did it like over the Christmas break. So mm -hmm. we did the whole album in like 10 days, <laughs> oh, wow. which was wild. Uh, and then we had somebody else mix it and he did a great job. And we had uh, Oasis Mastering master it. And they always did a great job. It's mm -hmm. who I use for everything. And okay. like, yeah, the album's doing really well. Um, it's selling really great in the UK, especially uh, as merchandise for like the vinyls and everything. Oh, wow. We have pretty passionate fans over there that like, we'll, we'll buy a lot of stuff. They're really yeah. supportive. So it's been great to have like new music out there, especially yeah. it's the first time that I've gotten to write my own drum parts on the album. So that's been cool. Yeah. You know? Awesome. And I mean, I guess that's why you're doing a lot of touring in the UK because there's a, obviously a fan base over there. Yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. definitely. Um, the guitarist, like I said, had a pretty popular blues band over there called the hoax. Mm. And so there's a little bit of a built in fan base. Like okay. they've also done a lot of work to like build their fan base over there. Mm -hmm. But there will be uh, like a section of fans for each other. It's like, I know you from the hoax, uh, and, you know, and okay. like the music is similar ish enough that there is some crossover, but I guess I'd rather it that way, like be able to go tour over there a bunch yeah. as opposed to like having people over here, having to fly like a bunch of different places. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and you said, you know, they've done a lot of work to, be able to tour over there and to have a following over there do you know kind of what that was like kind of w what are some of the things that they did to kind of get a fan base in the uk yeah well it's a lot of touring mm -hmm. um because at the end of the day like playing live is how you build your audience mm -hmm. um they're also really creative with the way that they run like facebook uh, advertisements and whatnot okay. like we're completely independent. Mm -hmm. um, so they're good at taking the money they do make and investing it back into the band. Um, and they like, uh, cut corners is not the right word, but like they invest in the right places back into the band, right? Uh -huh. So um, I guess that's the answer is playing out a lot, spending a lot of time like getting in front of people and showing them your music. Because like how many of us spend all this time in the studio making music 
and then we release it and we don't advertise it, mm -hmm. it's like people aren't going to find it. You right. know, that's the most important part. It's like get out in front of people, play your music, and advertise it. You know, yeah, like be proud of it. Yeah, you worked yeah, yeah. hard on it. Absolutely, yeah, definitely. Um, I, I feel like a lot of a lot of times we as creatives, as artists, we put a lot of time, energy, money into the product itself, but then we don't necessarily leave ourselves a budget or like or put enough brain power into the marketing or into the advertising into actually pushing it out there. Yeah, definitely. It's it's something I struggle with for sure too. Mm -hmm. Like I have my own music that's like solo project stuff. Um called patchwork mm -hmm. um with an underscore after it if you want to find it <laughs> on spotify it or out. anywhere you get your music um and that's like stuff that i've just written by myself and then i kind of treat them as journals like that mm -hmm. i put out <laughs> it's like that's just for me kind of and if people like it that's fine i never thought i would be like this solo artist that would go travel and play my music i've always kind of been like a hired gun for people but yeah i'm guilty of like putting it on Spotify and then not really telling anyone. Or I'll do like one Instagram post, like, hey, new song. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, and then of course too, like I get in my own head. I'm like, oh, nobody likes it because nobody listened. It's got like this many streams or this many likes on Instagram. And it's like, you know, it is true that you need those things, especially nowadays in order to quote unquote, like make it. Um, but I can't be mad if I've done one Instagram mm -hmm. post, you right. know? Right, right. Yeah, I think, sometimes we put out that one Instagram post and we think that like, we think that's enough. Like we think that people are going to see it from that. But I mean, you know, maybe, you know, like algorithms are weird sometimes. Maybe people didn't see it. That would have actually checked it out. Maybe somebody saw it and they were at work and they couldn't really actually like go listen to the thing. Maybe they had intentions to do so, but they just they couldn't listen to the thing at the time yeah. so it's like and i've had things where like months later i'm putting out you know some type of um you know video or something for a song on instagram and like somebody will be like oh this new brand new song is fire like i'm like no this thing's been out for months right but to them that this this was the first time that they've heard it so like that was like a trigger to me like oh okay like sometimes people don't like people don't see it the first time you, you know what I mean? Like it's new to us. And then like by, you know, like week two of talking about it to us, it feels old. And it's like, okay, we don't want to like, we're not trying to like bug people or yeah. we're not trying to, you know, like hammer this thing and we don't want to get like be annoying and this and that and that. But a lot of times people haven't seen it. Yeah. And, and like, I feel like it was like Tyler, the creator. It was like, you know, you put all this time and energy, like, besides like who cares like who cares if people like even if they did see it like so like so what like yeah. you know you put all this time and energy into it you might as well like shout it from the mountaintops and like you know just keep pushing it out there so like i mean that's definitely something that i'm like trying to get better at um and just in understanding that yeah like everybody didn't see it the first time and you know it's there's nothing wrong with like constantly pushing your things you said that they get creative in terms of how they advertise or how they like do ads whatever what did what did you mean by that well they would be probably the, the yeah, ones right. to ask about right, it right. but it, at least like what robin and greta have kind of shown me like peeked under the hood a little bit mm -hmm. um like they're running super super targeted ads mm. so they know that we have a show coming up in say edinburgh for example and they will like run specific targeted ads for a certain age group that listens to a certain type of music in Edinburgh. Um, and they've like, maybe they've interacted with a blues page in the last month or something like that. Mm. So, and for each of those ads, they're paying like 50 cents for an ad or something like that. Mm. Um, and I, we get a lot of people come to the show where I'm like, I always ask people, how'd you find out about us? And more times than not, they're like, Oh, I saw an ad on Facebook. And I know that kind of helps with our fan base because our fan base out there is a little older um, because of the blues scene, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but at first I was a little like self-conscious about that. It's like, oh, we got an older like, you know, fan base, which is fine. But then you realize like that's the – those are the fans that A, they're on Facebook, mm -hmm. right? And B, they are passionate. Like they are from an era where you buy your music, you support your artists. 
and they've got the attention span to listen to like a two hour show. Mm -hmm. Um, so now I'm like, that's rad. Like that's super cool. You know? So if, if it's not Facebook ads, it's Instagram, it's TikTok, it's all, all the above, you know? Um, it's just like finding your artist and I'm sorry, finding your audience Mm -hmm. and like leaning into it, you know? But you got to know what your audience is. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, definitely. Yeah. Cause I, I feel like I've done a little bit of like, of, um, you know, Facebook ads and things like that, but I would definitely want to like play with that more, uh, because like, it seems like the people that have it figured out, like it works really well for them, but it's just a matter of like, I'm sure they went through some trial and error to like figure out, you know, what works and what doesn't. So I think that's like, you know, definitely something that I want to, you know, want to dive into um, a little more going forward with, yeah. you know, the next round of music that I put out, you know, and like really kind of uh, figure out how to how to master that, you yeah. know, because I feel like that if you can do that, then and, and that's that's awesome to hear that it, it works like you've personally talked to people who came to the show because of the Facebook ads, you yeah. know, because sometimes like I feel like, you know, we hear all these things, you know, like. I might look up on, you know, YouTube, like, what's the best way to market your music? And then you hear somebody say, like, oh, yeah, you can run Facebook ads and this and that. But it, it sounds like a pipe dream sometimes. Like, it sounds like, okay, yeah, but does that really work? Right. But so it's cool to, like, have you sit here and say, like, yes, I have firsthand heard somebody say that they came to this show because of the Facebook ads or the Instagram ads or whatever. Right. So, and it's like, you know, it's working, mm-hmm. which is like, you don't get that a lot of days, a lot of times nowadays, you know, it's like, you don't get that gratification mm-hmm. of being like, Oh, I found you. And I don't know you, mm-hmm. especially when you're starting out, yeah. you know, and you're already mm-hmm. like, you're already great at like making like dope music videos and like pushing your music out there. Like I see your stuff all the time, you know? So like, if you targeted that stuff, especially since you've got the media already, like you've got good music, you've got good videos. Like that's what people want to see, mm-hmm. you know? So like, if you threw it at the right people there and then tell those people, like, here's the music, here's the video. And I'm going to be playing in your city on this day. Mm-hmm. And here's your, t- your ticket link. Like if people just have to click one thing, Oh, this is cool. I'll go do that. Like make it easy for people. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and like, like this is like really giving me personally like, uh, like some new like energy again because like I said, I feel like I've tried some things. I'll try like email marketing, for example, and I'd be like, eh, it didn't work. But th- but but maybe there was like two emails I sent out. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and so like I feel like in general, a lot of times we'll do something twice and then be like, ah, well that didn't work. Right. But maybe we just didn't know what we were doing. Maybe we just didn't have the right language in the email or the right this or the right that or the right whatever. So again, it's like, you know, you got to keep trying the stuff and, you know, but again, it's really good to hear that these things can work. So And it's easy to get frustrated too. Like mm-hmm. it's human nature when, especially if you have like that imposter syndrome that it seems like a lot of us musicians have where you're like, I'm, I'm not good at this, yeah. but I want, but I, I want people to think I am like, we are good. It's okay to like be confident. You know, mm-hmm. um, we put a lot of work in to make sure that, you know, we can do what we say we can do. Mm-hmm. So it's like, be confident, put your stuff out there. And if people don't want to hear it at first, just keep throwing it at them. You know, it's like, I know I sound like a hypocrite right now because it's like, I've been in the same boat uh-huh. and I still am a lot, but yeah, just keep like making yourself available to people, you know? Absolutely. That's what's up. Um, also wanted to talk to you about like we're we're here we're in your home studio uh that you've got here which is it's really dope um and you know i feel like you know there's people that um are out there and they you know have their own studios or they're like making their own studios like what kind of went into like making this making this place because it's really dope cool well first thank you like i'm glad that you like it like the reason why i built this place was when i was at warner I saw a lot of artists come in, not necessarily that were getting signed, but they were getting like bankrolled by people where like, in my opinion, they weren't doing music for the same reasons that I saw some of my friends who were super talented Mm -hmm. doing the music. And like these people were getting bankrolled and I had friends that were like way more talented that like couldn't get into a studio. Mm -hmm. So 
I thought like if I could build the right spot, like I know I can get like pro level sounds um, in a smaller space and I could do it for a lot cheaper for people. Um, so that's what I did. Like I, I bought this house in 2016. I was really fortunate and we it had this detached garage mm-hmm. and, uh, the person that I, that had lived here before actually is the drummer on the voice. Oh, and wow. so he, this was a studio already. Oh. And unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, cause I got to make my own, but like he gutted it and made it a garage <laughs> to oh. make sure the house sold. Okay. So I bought the house and I turned it back into a studio. <laughs> that's funny. And, uh, so I built this extra wall here, which y'all can't see on the video, but it's yeah. just like, it looks like that wall, but over there, uh-huh. but like, that's where the garage door is. Oh. Um, so I built that it's four walls. Like it's a room within a room, basically. Uh-huh. Um, I painted all the walls. Um, I worked with someone and built all these panels, um, measured the room and everything. There's like clouds and the like clouds of the baffling on the ceiling. Uh-huh. Um, and the point of the room was to be able to, have it be live enough that like drums and piano and stuff would sound good in here, but Uh dead enough that I could do vocals in here and mix. Um, And I feel like I found like a really nice balance between the two. Um, And I really did a lot of it myself. I wired it myself. I built the whole thing myself. Um, I mic'd it all up myself, obviously. It's just like, I wanted it to be like a finely tuned machine. And like we have all these headphone boxes, so everyone has isolation. Like you can record everybody at the same time, so you can get like a pro feel in here for sure. Yeah. Um, and most importantly for me, it still feels like you're kind of sitting in a living room, mm-hmm. so you don't get the red light fever, mm-hmm. where it's like you see that red that red record light come on. Sometimes people like get a little tense, uh-huh. but in here it's just like we're chilling. Yeah. Like don't worry about it. There's not a lot of stress, so I, we tend to get it pretty good. Um, takes in here because of that yeah yeah so no. building it was i wouldn't call it easy but it was easier than i thought it would be hmm. you know how long did it take you probably about six months um <laughs> the hardest part was putting air conditioning in here because uh-huh. uh, originally we had put like the ac unit on one wall and then like it stopped working and started leaking everywhere uh-huh. so we had to like take it out of that wall and put it in another wall okay. um and we had to like run its own power line for that and everything uh, so that part was hard, but yeah, like anything, it's just problem solving, you know? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right on. And I've, I, I've done full band stuff in here. I've done, um, solo stuff in here and it all, yeah, it all always sounds great. It's always, uh, really dope. So that's what's up. Great job <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, doing all this, putting this all together. Um, so you said it took you like six months, huh? Yeah. I mean, so it was already kind of gutted cause it was a garage. Uh-huh. The wall took like two days uh-huh. it really wasn't that hard like there's rock sole insulation in between the two walls mm-hmm. um and it's just like plastering you know Got putting it. stuff up there um we built the door out of like solid wood so it'd stop a lot of sound um there's two doors there to block a bunch of the sound so that was like a one week project uh-huh. painting was another week um putting the hardwood floors in was another week um and then the baffling took like two or three weeks um just to like put all together and then hang up And then wiring and the air conditioning, that's what took the longest, you know? Yeah. And yeah. And, and and again, like the, the sound quality, like everything sounds great that I've done in here. So again, like kudos to you. Um, I wanted to ask you as well, like, I know, you know, for a lot of artists, you know, it's, it's hard out here, you know, things it's expensive. Number one, just living in Southern California, like LA is just like crazy expensive. Um, so for like people who are, you know, just, you know, trying to kind of maybe put together like a home recording situation, like what, do you, in your opinion, what is like the, ba- like you need this basically to like get a decent sound uh, and maybe what could you like do without and what, like, like what's the best way to get like a good sound for, I guess, for not a lot of money. Cool. So like, I would say you want to make sure you have like a, Obviously, like, a good microphone, but not, like, one that's so wildly crazy expensive. Like, I use uh, Slate microphones, mm-hmm. um, A, because I work there, and, and but B, they're, like, they're cheap, and they're emulation mics, so you can make them sound like a big plethora of whatever mic you want. Mm. Um, 
those are like $800 for a large diaphragm condenser one, which is not like cheap, but if you have that one, you basically have a whole mic locker. So you can do a bunch of stuff with that. Mm -hmm. Um, They also make small diaphragm ones for like a hundred bucks a pop or something like that. Mm -hmm. So as far as like a mic collection goes, you can get a whole mic locker for like a grand, which is not like, again, not cheap, but not 25K for like, a vintage Neumann or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, And then something that people skip out on a lot that I think you should spend money on Uh is your interface, Um, like your recording interface. So like the A to D conversion and D to A, like analog to digital, that's super important. Super, super important because I've recorded on systems that like have like shoddy interfaces and no matter how good your mics are and stuff, if it goes through that, it's going to sound bad. Mm. So like I use an Apollo, which it was like, I think it was two, two grand okay. for an eight channel one. Mm-hmm. Um, but they have, they have them with, they have like, a duo, know, which is two, yeah, two channels. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm not sure if they have a four channel. I think it's a mm. duo and then the eight channel ones. I'm probably wrong, but, nah, <laughs> um, but yeah, I use those, but there's other like great ones out there that you can find. Um, again, you don't have to spend 10k on it, but right. like that stuff's important to me, especially for your home recording. Mm-hmm. Like nice sounding microphone, um, nice sounding interface, and then I use Pro Tools, but there's a lot of different DAWs you can use, yeah. obviously. Um, yeah, so all of that's fine and good, right? <laughs> but the most important thing that you can do uh-huh. is work with talented people (laughs) Mm. because like there's so many times that I've been like recording someone. I'm like, wow, this is effortless. Am I really even doing anything? Cause this person's really talented. Mm -hmm, Right. mm -hmm. So like pick your artists carefully, I'd say is important. Mm. Um, cause it's going to be really hard to record someone that isn't helping you out. I'm not saying you can't do it, but like if you're going to spend the money on this microphone and you're, a to D conversion and blah, blah, blah. Uh, you're going to want to record like with talented people. Right. I know that's like easier said than done, yeah. but it's LA. Yeah. You can find ta- talented There's, people everywhere. They are, they are out there. Yeah. Absolutely out there. Indeed. Um, yeah. I feel like, you know, I do hear people, um, you know, cause people tell me like one of the things that they struggle with is, um, maybe finding bandmates or finding people to collaborate with, but they're out there, yeah. you know? So I think it's just a matter of, you know, getting out there and finding those people. Like, um, you know, there's a ton of open mics, for example, that, you know, you can hit. And uh, like I host one at Writers Round LA, but like people can go to these things and other artists are hanging out there. There's yeah. other, and, you know, if you're looking for, uh, if you're looking for, a drummer you can hang out where full band shows happen hang out at viper room hang out at whiskey hang out at you know what i mean some of these places where full band shows frequently happen and then maybe you know you'll run into a drummer and you know like talk to the different drummers that you come across and you know maybe you'll hit it off with one of them definitely you know yeah it's it's easy nowadays to be introverted especially when Mm -hmm. i mean as a musician a lot of us are introverts anyway right like to get good at our instruments we probably had to spend a lot of time by ourselves in our rooms practicing Uh so it's like a lot of us are introverts so it's hard to go talk to people and make yourself available um but it's it's so important to like get out there and go to open mics like yours and just like meet other people that have the same interest and like you see a drummer you like be like oh you're dope Mm -hmm. i really like your stuff like what are you working on right now oh are you available like i've got a project that i'm working on um That sort of stuff. Also, you can just being like making yourself available. Like, how did we meet? Like, we met because we were hooping together. Yeah, yeah, we played basketball together, and like we played for like a year before we even talked about like music. Yeah, yeah, I was like, I got to leave early. I got a session, and you were like, Oh, so what do you do? I was like, Oh, I'm an engineer producer. You're like, Oh, cool. I sing. I'm like, Oh, sweet. And then you just came over and checked out the spot. But it's like going out there and finding communities. You can find people. And like, if you're open and willing, you can find like, like finds like, mm-hmm. you know, but you got to get out of the house. <laughs> Absolutely. Like it, it's crazy because I'm an introvert too, like 1000%. Um, and which, you know, some people might think that's weird cause I host a lot of things and I'm like out a lot. Um, but that's something that like being out a lot is something that I force myself to do because 
I knew that it was uncomfortable. It's like I forced myself to be uncomfortable because it was one of those things that I knew I like was a weakness of mine. Yeah. And so I knew that networking was important. And so I knew that I needed to like get out there and meet people, even though like, you know, having a conversation with like three strangers, three strangers is like terrifying to me. Like I could be on a stage in front of a hundred people and be fine. But like, if I'm talking to like three or four people like that, I don't know, like I'm like, I'm very uncomfortable, Yeah. but, that's that's what you have to do though like you have to like get comfortable being uncomfortable sometimes you definitely know? yeah i mean it's it's easy for a lot of us when we're on stage to be like there's that barrier of music mm-hmm. where you're like oh if they don't like it they don't they don't dislike me it's okay they just dislike my music which can hurt too um but you don't have to feel like you got denied when you walk up to someone and you're like oh i play i play keys are you uh-huh. looking to collaborate and you're worried, like, what if they say no? Yeah. Like, that means they don't like me. And, you know, like, getting past that point of your he- in, in your mind is, like, that's a hard thing to do. But uh-huh. it's, like, fun. It's like any relationship. Like, you're going to have to get denied a couple times. But then when you find, yeah. like, that right group of people, you can be playing with these people until you're old and gray, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, all of my best friends I play music with, yeah. honestly. Yeah. You know? So, and there's people that I've known since high school that I've, I still play with all the time, Mm -hmm. you know? So you can find really good people. Yeah, absolutely. Like, yeah, a lot of the people that I play with in terms of like full band shows, it was like, you know, a lot of them we just met at, you know, some showcase or some open mic or something. And like, you know, and we're, you know, a lot of us are really good friends and, you know, it's like, it's a great vibe. And, um, and, you know, sometimes you go through playing with other people that may not necessarily, it may not necessarily be as much of a vibe, but that's part of the process, Yeah. you know? Um, but, and I think sometimes people get discouraged from those situations that don't work out, but, you know, sometimes it's like, you just got to keep, you know, keep looking for the people, you yeah. know, and then you can find some great situations. Definitely. You know? Yeah. And you got to be like, I know this whole thing that we're talking about is like being okay with failing. It's like, that's so important, man. That's like, a lot of people are afraid to fail. Like, when I was at Warner, my first time I got a call as a session musician, um, the session musician that Rob and Doug had been using moved to Nashville. Mm. And um, they were like, okay, here's your time. If you want to sit in on a session, like, let's do it. And I was like, okay, I'm going to be a session drummer. Let's go. And like I hyped myself up and the the beat was so simple. It was like four on the floor and I was just I just had to play a backbeat on top of it. And because I'd never like really sat down and been like, okay, let me think about how my four on the floor sounds. Like my kick drum and my snare were flaming just a little tiny bit. Mm. And like Rob was like, Hey, your kick and snare is flaming. Can you fix that? I'm like, oh for sure. Try another take. Couldn't couldn't fix it. Trying one more. And then Rob's like, okay, we're going to get someone, someone else. And I like, dude, I was devastated. Uh, I was so devastated. Uh, and so like, I just got in the lab and I was for like a year, all I did was just practice that practice it, practice it, practice it. And then luckily Rob and Doug gave me another chance, like a year and a half later. Mm-hmm. And one of those things came up and I nailed it. Mm-hmm. And it's not like Rob was like, good job. I can tell you've been practicing. Right. <laughs> but he's like, cool, great. And they just kept hiring me on more stuff. Um, and then Doug did tell me, he was like, I can tell you've been practicing. Good job. And I was like, yeah, thanks, man. But it's just like, you got to fail in order to get better. Especially mm-hmm. even if you fail in front of people that you feel like you aren't going to get another chance, mm-hmm. maybe you will, you know, yeah. people like to see growth. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I think too, cause I've, I've talked to musicians before and it's like, sometimes they're so afraid of like messing up that they don't like put themselves out there and, and and it's like and i've heard you know people say like well you never know who's gonna be around and you feel like you know sometimes you only got one shot it's like the eminem song like yeah. you know what i mean but which i mean which i i get that but at the same time it's like you gotta like put yourself out there and like you will fuck up sometimes like yeah, that's just like sure. you know what i mean like that's that's just gonna happen like that's a part of it but the lesson I think is like, which is like super dope is what you did is like, you went and practiced the shit out of that. Like, it's like, okay, I, I think every performance good or bad is an opportunity for growth. hundred percent. You know, like, and that's how I try to look at it. Like if I have a bad performance, it's like, okay, 
what can I take away from that? You know, I feel like there's a lesson in in everything, you right. know? And so it's like, all right, let me go home and work on what it is that I fucked up last night at the show or whatever. Right. You know what I mean? And so I feel like there's always an opportunity to like to get better and you you like learn from all these mistakes. And like, yeah. but the important thing is that you do go home and go back and like, okay, let's let's tighten that up. Right. Know? And it sounds so cliche, but like surround yourself with people who push you. Mm. Right? Like mm. My roommate is a session bassist. Mm -hmm. I've known him for a really long time. He's an amazing musician, right? Mm -hmm. But recently, he's been like hitting me up and being like, hey, man, can I go in the studio and play some drums? And he's like trying to play drums. And he's like, he's got rhythm. He knows what he's doing. But he'll like ask me questions like, oh, when you do this, how do you do that? Blah, blah, blah. I know I say blah, blah, blah a lot. Uh, <laughs> yada, yada, yada. Uh, <laughs> and it pushes me because I'm like, oh, man, Chris is in here playing drums like, I should probably be practicing. This is my instrument, you know? Uh -huh. So, like, uh -huh. he's pushing me to get better because he doesn't want to be stagnant, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, like, surrounding yourself with good players that are going to push you, you're going to get better too, you know? Absolutely. And if you fail during a performance and you're around people that push you, you can get better, you mm -hmm. know? But you got to fail. <laughs> right. You know? Right, right. No, I love that. Um, yeah, be around people that make you better a lot of times like you know i've heard and i've you know i've heard a lot of people say this like I, I listen to now like you know a lot of like millionaires and stuff like on youtube and whatnot like just like to get inside their minds sometimes you know what i mean because i feel like a lot of things that they say is like even though they're in like a different thing it's business but like the principles still apply like the basic like life principles and this one dude like uh alex hermosa he's always like if it if it's not working change your environment you know what i mean your, your environment is so key you know so like being around you know people who are doing the thing who are you know good at the thing who are also you know working hard you know who are pushing you to get better like i know there's some times where like you know so like i i you know, we'll book showcases or whatever. And like, you know, like Monday, Monday at Hotel Cafe, for example. And like a lot of times, even just attending that, like everybody is just really good. And then like, I, I know like sometimes I've booked lineups where I'm like, yo, I got to like come with it because like everybody on this lineup is fucking dope. So I don't, yeah. I don't want to be the one <laughs> yeah. that's like, you know, the, the weak link. Right. You know what I mean? So it's like, I know I got to like, I got to come with it. But like, I love that because it's like, it forces me to like, you know, it forces me to practice. It forces me to like kind of put my best foot forward. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. A like finds like, like we said. Mm -hmm. But then, like sometimes you see those people and you're like, should I quit music? <laughs> like this person is so dope at what they do. <laughs> oh, but man. it's like you can't you can't think like that. You know, yeah. like yeah. I'm guilty of it too. I'll see a drummer, especially like on Instagram and stuff. Uh -huh. There's so many people now where they're just showcasing chops. Yeah, and it makes you get in your own head, right? Mm -hmm. And like, I've even mm -hmm. posted something like on a story before where I'm like, ah, oh, this Instagram drummer is so dope. I need to get, I'm, I'm, I need to quit or like, I need to get, yeah. like, get myself better. And I've had like a friend respond. He's like, you are literally in England right now on tour, dude. Like, you're doing, yeah. they're not on tour. Like, just be happy, mm -hmm. you know? Like, accept that you're doing okay. Yeah, yeah. You know, you can get better and like use it as inspiration, but like you're not less than because they're doing something cool, you know? Yeah. yeah most of the time I'm good at like, at kind of compartmentalizing that in terms of like, okay, like there's a lot of dope people that I come across all the time, but most of the time it's like they do something different. There's something different about what I do and what they do. So there's something different that I, like, okay, this this sets me apart or that sets me apart. And so, yeah, they can be really good, but I can also be good and do my thing uh, as well. But there is one dude though, when I see him play, I'm like, yo, like, I don't know what, like, what the fuck am I even doing yeah. here? Like, this dude, this dude, Jacob Luttrell, he's, like, a monster. And when I see him, like, he sings and plays keys and, like, the, like, the runs he does, like, the vocal runs, and then he's a monster on the keys, too. And I'm just like, okay, why why am I even here? Yeah. There, so there's that one guy that's, like, I'm yeah. like, oh, shit, what the fuck? Like, I got that one guy, too. Yeah. Like, <laughs> his name's Justin Scott. I think uh -huh. on, Instagram, on Instagram, it's, like, J. Scott Drummer. Mm. This dude is so sick. Mm. Like, I'm, like, showing everybody. I'm like check this dude out check this dude out like yeah. he's so silky smooth and like it's so effortless and yeah. he's not just chopping the chop 
he's like, oh, he's so groovy. Anyway, like everybody check him out. That guy's really <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, same. That's how I feel about Jacob. But, you know, but it also inspires me at the same time. You know, yeah. it's like, the, like, like I always say, like, he's the only one that makes me want to like quit and like get inspired at the same time. Yeah. You know, um, but yeah, I try to use it as, you know, fuel to, to, to get better. You know, I'm like, yeah. I'm kind of uh, in a place now where I'm like, I'm definitely in like kind of like level up mode. Like, let me do everything I can do to try to up my skills and level up. So it's like, you know, piano lessons, that's vocal lessons. I'm doing like, I'm trying to do everything. Like, yeah. and I'm in the studio a bunch. Like, you know, we, you know, we've been working together a lot lately. Yeah. So like, I'm really trying to, um, you know, do everything I can do um, because I feel like, you know, we can control what we can control. You know, it's like, we can't necessarily control how many people, you know, like a post or how many people listen to the music. But I feel like I can control becoming, you know, the best that I can be. You know, I can control how much time I put into working on my craft. I can control, you know, um, whether or not I'm getting lessons from people who know what they're doing you yeah. know people who can because sometimes i feel like you do need like somebody to look at that and go like even though you know like okay yeah i might be decent or whatever but like you know sometimes you need somebody to be like oh well you you should do this like oh or oh, have you tried this like even just like something simple it's like oh yeah like so you may not have thought about you know somebody that you know is you know a step above you can look at it and be like oh maybe you should try this and you're like oh shit yeah, yeah that's a good point too because Something that we have nowadays is like unprecedented access to people that we look up to. Mm -hmm. So it's it's so important to like if you see that person on Instagram the way you're like, wow, they're killing it, like send them a message. Mm -hmm. Be like, yo, you're crushing it. Like, do you offer lessons? Yeah. Right? Like you can do Zoom lessons nowadays. When I I grew up in like the metal world and there was this band that like was so influential to me called Between the Buried and Me. I loved them so much. And the drummer, this guy, Blake Richardson, I was like, I want to drum just like this guy. And this was when I was 16 years old. Mm -hmm. And like, I just emailed them and I was like, yo, you guys are sick. Blake, you're awesome. Like I, I look up to you. Here's a, like a album that I played drums on. Um, I hope you like it. Do you offer lessons? And I sent it off. I'm like, they're never going to respond to that. Right. And in like five minutes, I got an email back. Wow. Oh, really cool. Well, check this out. And then like, I don't know, a day after that, oh man, listen to the album. That's super sick that you're doing this at such a young age. Um, yeah, we offer lessons. Uh, are you willing to fly out to North Carolina? Wow. And that's when I went to Winston-Salem because that's yeah, what they're based yeah. out of. And I was like, for sure. I went out there for a week and took like five lessons with wow. like the drummer that I like idolized wow. and like became friends with him. Right. So now when they come out here, like I, we say what's up after the show, like we've gotten dinner and everything, but like that all happened because I liked their music and I just reached out. Like, cause the worst thing that happens is they say no or they don't answer. Mm -hmm. Right. So mm -hmm. reach out to that person, like that person that you like, just say what's up and tell them you like them, you know, and yeah. be like, what can I learn from you? that's what's up like you, you can't be afraid to shoot your shot yeah like, you just got to do it um yeah like i and and to me like i've you know taken lessons just from people that i've seen here on the scene in la i'm like you know what she's a better keys player than i am let me learn from her right <laughs> you know what i mean and so and i've taken lessons with people that like i've just seen playing around you know because i'm like oh like i like how you did this like let i teach me that yeah you know like same thing vocally like i'm like oh yeah she's really dope or he's really dope like teach me yeah. <laughs> you know what i mean and so like and so i've been doing that like i'm i'm taking lessons with people that you know i see them like yeah they're better than me and i feel like a lot of times people can uh get threatened by that or like or, or whatever and yeah. it feels like oh it's competition like like nah like learn from that person you yeah know? yeah that's it's so important to not have that ego. Mm -hmm. It's weird. It's like, we we're just, I was just watching USA basketball and like, they were talking about like coach K would be like, bring your egos. Cause that's what made you who you are, mm. but make sure you keep them in check because like, we're all here as a team. Right. It's like, I feel the same way about music. It's like, okay, know that you're good. You put in the work, mm -hmm. but if you see someone that is doing something better than you, don't be threatened. Be like, that's dope. How can I do that? I'm going to ask them. I'm a fan of yours now, right? It's like, be a fan. Absolutely. And and we can, because like, we can learn from each other. And that's kind of like, honestly, the point of this podcast is like, we can learn from each other. There's a lot of, I feel like the LA music scene is like, 
a factory where they bake a secret recipe of cookies and like this person over here knows how much sugar goes in the recipe and this person over here knows the eggs this person over here knows the flour but a lot of times we don't necessarily like talk to each other it all it could be is like all of us having a conversation and we could get the recipe yeah you know what i mean we could like have the perfect cookie recipe we know how to do it because the knowledge is all here but it's just like a matter of like us all talking to each other yeah so that's kind of the point of the podcast that's what making music is in general right mm-hmm. it's like Unless you're just like a singer songwriter where you're playing guitar and you're singing, which is cool too. But like, I'm sure that even those people have people they bounce ideas off of, you know. But if you're, if I'm playing drums and you're playing keys and singing, and we've got Chris, my roommate, playing bass, uh-huh. and we've got a session guitarist, we're all bringing those different ingredients mm-hmm. and we're trying to bake that cake, mm-hmm. you know. And like, you can only do it all together, right? You can't just make a whole cake out of sugar. It's gonna taste terrible. It's gonna be terrible. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, Tom, man. I appreciate you, man. Dude, this has you. been amazing. Um, yeah, I appreciate you like inviting me into the studio to, to uh, you know, to film this, and uh, appreciate you being on the podcast. Yeah, man, man I appreciate you having me. That's that's super dope. I, I really like what you're doing with this, and like, yeah, keep it up. This is super cool. I'm gonna listen to all of them, and yeah, man, it's all about learning. Awesome, man. Sick. That's what's up, man. Appreciate you, brother. Thanks, man. Hey, what's up, y'all? It's Broadway, the host. If you got something out of the episode, definitely go ahead and hit the like button. Also, subscribe and turn on the notifications so you can get notified whenever we drop new episodes. If there was something specific that you learned or found interesting, put that in the comments. Also, if there was something that you thought you were going to learn more about, wanted to hear more about, and you didn't, uh, put that in the comments as well. We can use that to make these episodes better going forward. Thank you again for checking out. They're good at that shit.